Hello and welcome to another edition of Trash Arts Tick, episode three. With myself, Ryan, we got Sam, and we got Jackson. Hello. And later on, we're going to be joined by Jessica Hunt, um, and that's whenever we review um, some of the films that are coming out for February. Before that, though, we're going to be looking over industry. Sam's going to take that. And um, then we're actually going to be doing our first proper film review of Uncut Gems, which came out in January. So over to you, Sam. Last weekend was the BAFTAs. Um, it was dull to be as expected. The whole award ceremony and the whole season has been dull because the same names are popping up for the winners. And in 1917, won Best Director, Best Film and British Film, and it stops becoming interesting. The same actors won, they're expected to win the Oscars, they have won the Golden Globes, and it's... I mean, this happens every season, but sometimes you get a surprise. And the BAFTAs have decided for no surprises. Like in previous years, like last year, Best Film went to Roma. Oh yeah, yeah. And that, that did cool. not happen at the Oscars. That went to um, Green Book, which was the expected safe bet. Mm. Previ like years ago, when uh, Birdman won, it was against Boyhood and BAFTAs went for Boyhood. So BAFTAs have actually generally gone against the Oscars. But it all looks a bit too safe now. And the only good thing that seemed to happen at the BAFTAs is that Joaquin Phoenix... Phoenix? Phoenix. Joaquin <laughs> Phoenix. Joaquin Phoenix said a very good speech where he talked about how we need to have more inclusivity within film sets and how they're part of the problem and they need to go past that problem. And it was like, you know... YouTube it, everyone probably already has, but it was a good speech. It was a really good speech. And he seems to be using the whole entire, like, opportunity to go on and get his awards to campaign. And as we said before, he doesn't like award season, so it's kind of nice that he's using it for a real reason. Yeah. Um, Disney have bought Hamilton. Hamilton being the massive, big musical that, that is adored by um, Linwell Miranda. Miranda? Linwell Miranda? Yeah, so. yeah. Linwell Miranda. Um, it was obviously always going to be turned into a musical. That was guaranteed to happen at some point. The fact that Disney have bought the distribution rights for 75 million, <laughs> and that's not including commitment to a production. That's not budget for the production. That's just for distribution, the which is the yeah, biggest, yeah, and yeah, biggest ever. The potential spin-offs they can get, and the fact of what they could do with it within the streaming world as well, yeah, they're going to make their money back. That's guaranteed. <laughs> and then uh, finally, Sundance had the... Um, they gave out their awards. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting that like all the films that won the awards, none of them were the ones, the big acquisitions that we talked about last week. None of those films were nominated or won awards. They just made shit. They just were bought for a lot of money. Uh, the winner of the best film is a film called Minari by Lee Isaac Chung. Uh, that actually won two awards. That won the Drama Awards and it won the Audience Award. Which means it'll probably pop up at the end of this year when we talk about Oscars 2021. Because that's how these things work. The interesting thing about the, um, this year's winner is that although it's a Korean film, it's an American Korean film, there was a big film last year called The Farewell, which although didn't, people expected to win and get nominated for loads of Oscars, it didn't happen to get nominated for one. It was quite a big success, and it was a Mandalorian and uh, English production. Mm. So it's interesting that that one, it didn't win the Audience Award last year, but this one has won it this year. And it shows how the American indie film scene is clearly trying to pick up more on the multicultural side of America. And uh, finally, also, I uh, just want to plug that if anyone's in Portsmouth, we're having a film festival next weekend. That's on February 16th, Real Indie Film Festival. We got uh, three films from um, ourselves and a film from Portsmouth's History by Michael J. Murphy called Atlantis. And we're also going to be screening a film from Tom Lee Rutter, who, of course, we had on last week last being week. interviewed. And yeah, you can get tickets for £5 on their site or £8 on the door. And yeah. Starts at five. I'm really excited for this one, actually, because mm. I, I just love the fact that we've got the, you know, the that film for a, a Michael J. Murphy's film uh, that was shot here 30 years ago, uh, a film that was inspired by his work and uh, a film with this cast from later on. That's, you know, it's going to be a fun night. Yeah, it should be pretty cool. So for anyone local, please uh, 
come on down. I, I suppose at this point, spoiler alert, uh, we're going to be talking about uncut gems. So, uh, I'll kick it off really. Um, it surprises me that this film wasn't actually nominated because it's actually a fantastic film. The first 15, 20 minutes, you're just on the edge of your seat and it doesn't pause to slow down with the pace. It's like it's just a bump bar. It's just, constant, yeah. isn't it? It's like a uh, rush. It's the first thing that I turned around and said to <coughs> both of you, really, was just, oh my goodness, this is just constant. <laughs> it's well, not stopping. That's the thing. The film's being uh, described as quite a stressful film, which I kind of get because mm. it is just a non-stop sort of like constant bombardment of just sounds not just like you got the dialogue screaming at you but then you've got the sounds of New York and then you've got the score going into different places mm. and the camera's constantly moving with here we are here we are here we are but I think as well it mirrors the main character so Adam Sandler's character because he's constantly going through that emotion himself because of the characteristics and the way that he gets on and presents himself well, I felt like in that sense it was like it felt to me like a portrayal of gambling addiction of like essentially constantly trying to seek that new high of like rushing yeah. forward and you know uh, the fact that in a way his lifestyle of, of borrowing this money and and then being at risk of losing it if he can't if he can't make more money back um, it was almost the thing that drove him forwards constantly um, and in, in that sense, it kind of became his purpose, the, the, the fact that he had to pay everything back. It was, it was a real sort of like, it really made me think about gambling addiction in itself and, and the effects of it. It just shows how it can go out of control, how easily it can go out of control. Yeah. Um, very early on in the film, we established that he, he's got some money um, from doing a deal. And I think he puts a bet down um, straight off the bat for like, I think it's, what was it, $21,000? something along them lines, but that isn't his money. He should be actually using that money to pay back some of the people that he already owes money to. But in his mindset, it's right, I know that I'm going to win on the NBA, to win basketball, so I've got a good certain assurance that this bet's going to come in and I'm going to double my money, if not treble my money. Mm -hmm. And like you say, just the constant, right, okay, I've got to put more down to win more back. But then you lose it, so well, okay, I've got to find my next bit of money that I get in. Oh, right, okay, I've got a lot more. I can put that down and earn what well, gain more back. Yeah. And even even buying the that that stone, uh, the gem, the the gem itself, um, that was a gamble. That was a risk, like because he he was banking on it making making that million, million. wasn't he? And and it didn't. It wasn't. It wasn't anywhere close. Um, Thing is, it's, it's very much like uh, <coughs> one of those classic New York films. It's very, because it's, if you look at the executive producers, Martin Scorsese is one of the executive producers on the film, and you can feel it. It's just so 70s, where the character isn't like, there's always a bit of complexity to him with a bit of an anti-hero aspect, where you don't That's like fair. the character of Howie or Howard um, that Adam Sandler plays. He's, he's not a likeable character. But you empathise with him because he's got an addiction. Well, you, you do if... You, uh, that depends on your own situation, of course. But, like, you don't... It's not necessarily that. It's more like... When you have those characters like Travis Bickle in, in um, Taxi Driver and stuff, you don't... You're not empathising with their situation. You're going with their journey. And you're feeling... Because you, you, you want them to do the right thing. And essentially, in his mind, do the right thing is we're going to make more and more money. Okay, which, I don't know, though, because with this character, I do feel like there's a there's an... Uh, empathetic side to him where you can see that he's, it's a product of the situation that he's in that he's continuously uh, gone down this this spiral of debt essentially to try and like pay back and and the allure of gambling and, and winning that money out of yeah. nowhere can be like massive for the, like, and that's where I feel like he is quite you do sympathise with him, but at the same time, you recognise that he's not making rational, sensible think, decisions, and that he's not a particularly good person either. A lot of that as well, like with the sympathy, I know from my perspective, it was very much that whenever you see him doing the gambling, you see him getting the money, he's putting more money down, it's almost got complete control over his life and his actions. Then when you see him in the fleeting moments when he's with his kids... And like his oldest kid, he loves the fact that his oldest kid is into the NBA as much as he is. And they, they have that kind of relationship and that bond. But 
you kind of feel sorry for him because it should be stronger, but because everything else is taking control of his life, he, he can't give himself that. Well, it seems like any time that he's with the family and, and that same sort of the same type of thing that you're talking about, the whole film slows down. Yeah, and it, it that's the only point. It really like does. A, yeah, a, a, a break from all of that action and all of that bombardment. Um, and like, I, I suppose that's kind of kind of part of the, the, the nicer side of the character that's there, that, that you know, you can see that there's the potential for him to live a normal life. Um, and there was even that, that, there was a scene, I can't remember exactly what happened in it, but he made like a really clear statement that he was like, it, it, it was family time, so it was important. And uh, it just seemed like a very, very big break from the character that we'd seen previously, where he's running around trying, you know, doing yeah, anything yeah. to be able to scrape together new new bits of money and win money. That's the thing. It's just a great <coughs> character-focused film, and um, like I, I've, if you've seen the films by uh, Safdie Brothers, who are the directors, they did a film called Good Time with Robert Pattinson, which I think is also on Netflix at the moment. Um, that's a brilliant film. That's a really great film. It has a similar thing of just you just go in with the whole flow of it. And it's very tense as hell, and they seem to get that pace. Their pacing yeah. is mm. just brilliant. And although I prefer the story of Good Times because it's more of a crime story, um, you the, what they did in Uncut Gems is just brought that instantly iconic character to an actor that you don't expect it from. Mm. Adam Sandler's done a couple of like serious roles or roles of more acclaim in stuff like Paul Thomas Anderson's Punk Drunk Love and to some degree Judd Apatow's um, Funny People uh, he doesn't tend to go towards those films in his later years he's, he's done a few more like the Merowitz story by um, Noah Elmbach but generally speaking he keeps to what makes him a lot of money and his friends get to have a nice holiday doing yeah. and it's so nice <laughs> to see him actually put the effort and it sounds bad to say that because it's almost derogatory, but to see him go, actually, you're a fucking talented actor and you've just made an iconic character that also is going to be one of the most famous snubs, like you said earlier, of not getting an Oscar nomination. Mm. You won so many awards, but no Oscar nomination. Yeah. And it's quite Crazy. interesting because there was a, a leaked article from one of the actors who's on, I'm not sure if it's like the Oscars Guild, but the judging panel yeah. who decides who's nominated. They <coughs> came out anonymously and um, said that the reason that Adam Sandler was snubbed was basically because he had been, or he had associated himself with so many, like, let's uh, just quote, um, terrible comedy films that he didn't fit into that category of Oscar talented to be nominated. Which, which happens. It's which is so, like, fly, really. Because if you do get the chance to watch Uncut, um, yeah, Uncut Gems, um, it's absolutely a fantastic performance and I remember when we were watching it Jack you, you turned around you were just like I didn't even realise like I was watching Adam Sandler because yeah. the be character honest, is so I, until far away until Sam said about Adam Sandler just then I forgot that we were talking about a film that he was in yeah I, I really don't rate him very often but I, that that he was incredible and it just goes to show that you know given the right role given the right direction uh, what, what people can do yeah absolutely yeah. And hopefully he does do more stuff like that. But at the same time, he said that if he didn't get an Oscar nomination, he was going to yeah. be the worst film you've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> As a and snub. fair play on him, to be yeah, honest. Yeah. You know, like, we'll look forward to seeing that on Netflix soon. Can we talk about the ending? Cause I was just about to... Just like, can I say one thing before we do? So back to the whole empathy for the character. and. Yeah. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I almost was like rooting for him. I wanted him to have that happy ending. Yeah. And then the, the twist at the end. And you shouldn't have wanted that for him, but but, but like he dragged you into his uh, his feeling, didn't he? And it, it was the same with the um, main gangster character. What was his name? I can't remember now. Um, the, the, the one who he's got locked in the room uh, watching. It's and, like and Ori. The, you've Ori got the henchman getting pissed off but this 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 other this yeah, other yeah. character he's by the end he's like smiling and stuff uh, yeah like but that being locked in the box and just watching his fantasy play out was yeah that was that, that was just so powerful it's a perfect ending for the kind of story it was you, you, you might want a happy ending but if it did you'd feel like you you've, you've been, been, been cheated yeah. yeah but you're not expecting the ending that you get no it no. comes so out of the blue 
So basically, what happens is um, they, the hitman and um, the guy he owes money to, turn up at a store, which is in a like a, a tower block of buildings with probably loads of other different businesses within it. But he's got security locks, so there's like a security lock into what we I'd imagine is like a panic room, and then into the main shop. Um, so the henchmen try to get out because Adam Sandler's character sent his uh, mistress to do the bet. And when they get into the middle room, he then decides, actually, no, I'm not letting you out. And the hinge bricks. So they can't actually get out of this middle room. Yeah, they're stuck in like the airlock yeah. between the yeah, shop and that outside. And they have to watch Adam Sandler go through this emotion of this bet, and it's like a ridiculous bet. He's yeah, he's watching, he's watching uh, the uh, NBA on the on the screen, isn't he, in the in the shop, and yeah, uh, and yeah. he's made this uh, yeah elaborate bet of all these different things that's uh, the things that certain amount of plays. Yeah, and... exactly. And um, uh, he finally, he finally at the end wins it. And by that point, you're so like drawn in by the emotion and watching it that, that you, you're, you're totally there with him. You're like really hoping that he, he even, does it. Well, even to the point that the gangster character, he's on board with them and he's mm. like, oh my God, he did it, he did it. And then as soon as they, well, as Adam as Sandler lets him out yeah. into, back into the shop. It's just, you get the ending you get. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll say no more. Spoilers, no more spoilers. But yeah, you can watch. Um, yeah, that film just came out on Netflix. <laughs> yeah, yeah just, just because it came out in America, that. made a load of money. But because Netflix have obviously their big old deal with Adam Sandler, and it's all around the and uh, just for around the world, straight out. And yeah, it's a film that everyone should go and check out. Mm. Now, guys, we're going to move on to the films that are coming out in February. Um, and for this bit, uh, we're probably only going to go over four films. Um, but we're going to introduce Jessica Hunt. Hello. Hello. You sounded like a leprechaun. <laughs> Hello, dude. <laughs> it's morning. I feel like you've been, you've been sat in that corner. You've just say. suddenly been like activated. Uh, I do. You've... I turned I the switch like on at the back of your head. <laughs> I'm like, Hello. <laughs> oh. I did the robot just so you know. <laughs> We're going to have to start videoing this in later editions just to show you the ridiculousness that you we get up to. You could have saved yourself that. Yeah. Really. I felt like the voice just sounded very off if I didn't explain. Yeah. I was willing to just Have you like, heard no. me on this? Yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, um, this is so, so serious what, what until films, I joined. What, I'm what so sorry. Are coming out? Come on. So yeah, there's... Um, there's a couple of films coming out that we're going to look at. Um, there's The Lighthouse, yeah. which I believe came out in this in this country um, last weekend. Which we've it's been just, it's, it's yeah. bullshit. The we've been waiting for ages. Yeah, it's still <laughs> still not out. Yeah. I think it was Christmas, what the twenty seventh. Yeah. Uh, I think it's thirty first. I think it's Friday. Yeah. Then there's Birds of Prey, the new DC movie, uh, Sonic the Hedgehog, and The Invisible Man, Bloomhouse's uh, reinvention of the Universal Monsters. Okay, well, take every minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the the lighthouse guys. Lighthouse. Well, have you seen? Did you see yeah, the trailer yeah. for it? Yeah. So it, it's kind of very obscure. I, I think what well, they've done two trailers for it now, and the first yeah. one was like a teaser, and it didn't really give too much away. But it's shot in a like a smaller frame. Yes, yeah, four point three uh, frame. From what um, someone actually told me at a party last weekend. <laughs> The, the, they, it was all shot pretty much on like the, the old, you know, proper film. It's not digital. Yeah. It was on oh, wow. that sort of technology. Back is that then. what gives it its grimy sort of gritty look? I think so. Yeah. And the thing is, if you remember, like with Robert Eggers, the director, he did The Witch, and you ah. can see there's very much going back to that kind of beautifully framed shots where he's playing with lighting. There's there's a lot of beautifully lit scenes in the in um, The Witch. And you sort of get that from, from what you see in the black and white. There seems to be a lot more levels than just basic, mm. like a grey, grey sort of thing. It seems like it's played with shadow a hell of a lot, even yeah. just in the yeah. trailers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. And I think, I think that ratio kind of gives it a feeling like the whole thing is darker, um, simply because like part of the screen is, is actually darker. And it's, it's, it's yeah. black, you know, it, it makes it feel like, just from seeing the trailer, obviously, just makes it feel more enclosed and mm. more, you know... Um, but I, I'm so excited to see this film. I don't know. I don't know what to make. I mean, it's obvious that you're gonna see two 
uh, men go mad together in a lighthouse. Um, <laughs> what? But, but what, Spoiler. What else? What else? Uh, I, I have no idea. I have no idea what to expect. It's interesting. We're planning on going and seeing that within the week. Um, and we want to do a review on that in particular because I think all three of us, Jess, yeah, I yeah, suppose, I mean, included. I'm coming. Um, yeah, we're very excited to see this film. So expect that in a few weeks. Yeah, because you're right. Like, all we've seen a trailer at this point. But the rave kind of buzz about it is, again, performances that should have been nominated for an Oscar. A lot of people said William Defoe should have been nominated for Lighthouse. It only got one Oscar nomination with uh, cinematography, which, again, you can kind of see from the trailer. Mm. That yeah, seems kind right. of like an obvious sort of thing. And he was part of that group that last year there were three horror directors who made their second film. There was Jordan Peele with um, Us. Uh, there was Ari Lester with Midsommar who did Hereditary. Oh. And then he did uh, Lighthouse. And they all nice. just got like complete acclaim. So Roger Eggers like, I'm really excited for what he's going to do next. I know he's been talking about doing Nosferatu as well. And the guy's just got a real sensibility where he knows how to scare the shit out of you. But he's going to make it <laughs> stunning. He's going to make sure every level of the craft mm. is at the highest point it can possibly be. Yeah, I mean, It's not it's, just a jump scare. Yeah. He it's, gets, there's more art and it's yeah, more yeah. If, if you think I'm wrong, but it's almost like he tries to build some sort of level of aut- authenticity as if these were like found stories. You know, yeah, so from you, a certain time, like... He, he puts the effort into them almost seeming like they're from... They're not, they're not made now. Seeming classic. Yeah, yeah. 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 It, it makes a lot of effort to do that, I think. That's it, because the witch is almost like... Because even it's like the way its rules are, they're very medieval. They're proper mm. down to like the, the paganistic kind of ideas. But it feels like almost like history and, wrapped yeah, in Yeah, that's it. You know? It feels so authentic. And again, it seems like he's doing exactly the same thing with this film. Yeah. And, because and it, I, I'm, I mean, whenever I've seen films that are sort of focused in uh, character pieces with two actors, or, or you know, I assume it's only going to be two two characters Seems really. So, yeah. um, a, you just get this real uh, rich character with so many dimensions and so well developed because the directors had so much time to work with that one person to get that performance exactly yeah. the way they want it, and with two fantastic actors like you. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm it's almost like theatre. Yeah, it really yeah. is. Yeah. It truly, it is. Yeah. Apparently, the production was a. From what I've read, like it was a grueling experience. It was a, they, they had yeah. a horrible oh, really? time. Really? How so? What, what does because mean? of the things that they had to go through and not knowing too much about the plot, you gotta wonder. Yeah. The psychological, yeah. physical, it could be. Kind of like Mother in some respects. Where I mean, there's probably a lot both of physical... exposed for the... In- Sorry. I was just thinking that, you know, like you mentioned about it being like a play. Well, mm-hmm. even in a play, you'd have moments to cut. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas if you're always... You're the whole film. That's, that's a whole lot of acting. Mm. You know, yeah. like even a leading character in most films would still have moments away from certain scenes but that yeah, pro- yeah. probably won't be the case mm. and in the trailer you see you see moments where they're pulling ropes they're digging they're, they're in the water you know it, it must have been physically draining yeah, um, yeah. but I imagine it's it, it's just made it more, more the better to be honest <laughs> so uh, the next film is uh, Birds of Prey changing a little bit from uh, Art House Horror yeah. to Margot Robbie <laughs> Margot Robbie I have, I, 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 yeah, I've got a massive crush on Margot Robbie. It's my celebrity crush. But um, I do have a little bit of beef with her because she did get engaged on my birthday. Well, that, that's the first thing you want to say about the film. Wanna, that is the first thing I want to say. Let's discuss the film. Let's go straight well, to you save attractive. yourself, Margot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, get, back about. get back to it. Get back to it. My number is... Comment. <laughs> Comment underneath. Yeah, we so, want to know yeah. what, the, what was that all about. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to the next film. No. <laughs> so, yeah, this is obviously not... I don't know. It's, it's like... It's, it's still part of DC's course correction. Course correction. Batman vs Superman was terrible. So true. Mm-hmm. And then you got <laughs> Suicide Squad, which was terrible. But they went, ooh, but people really like these elements. Mm. And Margot Robbie's like two-time Oscar nominee now for, what was it, um, Bombshell, and what was the other film, the ice skating one? Oh, yeah, to- Tona? I Tonya. I Tonya. I Tonya. I was close. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, I don't know, it's just... I respect them wanting to do different things with it, because it, 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 why not? 
it's a very stale comic book skit. But do you ever get this feeling like it's almost like a bank balance? Because of the films previously being so god awful, they're like in their overdraft right now. <laughs> <laughs> They need uh, Adam cool. Sandler. Yeah, character. this is why they're like, right, like, guys, we need to give it all we got. <laughs> Top Mark Robbie in hot pants. Ooh, we'll be sorted before Christmas. <laughs> What's it like? Sorry, I don't... that was mental. <laughs> I liked it. But it was a great analogy. Hey. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I think it's like it's one of those difficult ones. Too tough for that. The behind the scenes stuff because they've got it's this intention to obviously to tell female stories, to have female filmmakers behind it, which again, is a good intention. To Ooh. me, it's still down to, let's hope there's quality behind the work they're doing. Oh, I'm just fearful. It's, I'm, I'm yeah, just it's... terrified. I'm kind of, I'm of the mindset that like, with the trailer, they've given away too much. Like, there's far too much action and it's either going to go one way or the other. You've seen everything that you need to see and the rest is they just... They did that with Suicide Squad, yeah. actually, yeah. Or it's going to be really, really good. My personal feeling on it is if you have an element of a film which was really, really good, the re you, well, you've got to look at the reasons why they were really, really good. Was it because they were utilised in such a way that their character had enough screen time to make every single moment count that was awesome, mm. which then made their character work, take that away and then give them their own kind of yeah, full picture. Work. Yeah, because you can't get them look like I remember in um, Suicide Squad when you first introduced to Harley Quinn, she's in the cell, isn't she? And she's like licking yeah. the bars and everything and awesome. she's teasing the, the security officer yeah. um, or the police officer. That's just fantastic. But to see that once is cool. But if you're going to have a whole film of that, it starts to dilute it and it's yeah. not. But this as, is the thing, I don't think that's their intention. Cause if you what, would hope not. The full title was it? It's um, Birds of Prey: The Emancipation. Is it Emancipation or is it? Emancipation of Harley Quinn. Yeah, the Emancipation of Harley Quinn, which is the the way of disconnecting <laughs> the idea with the Joker because of the way you know that's already problematic as it were. And, and again, you know these going. films are technically designed for younger people, and they're trying to give the more. It's a tricky one. I don't know. It's, okay, it's all right. It's, We're dying to say it. It's just. If you if you change the gender of this film, we'd have a lot of unhappy women on our hands. Yeah. This film is against men. She kills the Joker within the first two seconds of the trailer, and then the whole rest of the film is they're buddying up to kick ass, male ass. Kind of, <laughs> you know, I, like I kind of have mixed feelings. A gay about man's this. ass. <laughs> <laughs> Not to be touched by a woman. <laughs> I just, I'm a bit like, what is this story? What is this message? But the thing, I, I suppose it, it's kind of flipping, flipping what's happened quite a lot throughout cinema. So it, it's, it's in a way them reclaiming. Uh, I've never seen a film that, that targets but... men so heavily. <coughs> But like I do, I do feel like men. again that I might just be marketing from the trailer to try yeah. and get that But doesn't that, that sort terrify you that, that if this film, which it clearly is, think of the overdraft, <laughs> playing on its strengths, to what be they fair, think the audience wants to see, like if, that's awful. If you switched on us and started hunting us down, yeah, I'd be terrified. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. right. But who's to say that this film is not gonna? Make people think that that sort of behaviour is okay. But then you could argue exactly the same thing that people said about the Joker. Yeah. That's exactly the same argument. That's true. People might go to the extreme details. That's true. I remember saying that. They are entertainment pieces. And in the end of the day, like, they're more... People, if they want to be embrace that kind of character, mm. they'll go and cosplay. Do you know? <laughs> the thing that annoys me about it is, 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 like, is that it is just uh, promoting itself off of feminism it's just sort yeah. of it's, it's not kind of like not the right kind of feminism no no it's sort of a misinterpreted again, understanding of feminism if Margot Robbie like, well wanted we can sell that we can commodify that and turn that into a product it's just so <laughs> not cool <laughs> it's, I don't know but if, it's, if the actor wants because she's the producer on Birds of Prey so she got she worked with the director to develop the story and stuff maybe she wants to say the right message who knows but it's yeah, probably cool. I just can see the backlash of comments that this film's going to get. Like, guess they were all on their period. It's just going to... No, no, like, yeah, it's just going to force worry, this. That's, we can't worry that's about what a load of though. fucking alt-right nutjobs are going to say. But the problem yeah. is, is that, like, that's, how much of a trigger like that. is this film? 
Oh. Yeah, but the people that are being triggered by it kind of need to think why they're being triggered, really. <laughs> I think, like, yeah, but I get, get the point. over it. You know I get the I mean? point. <laughs> I get the point. But then is that like sort of an abuse of marketing to stereotype it in one way to attract that kind of audience? Yeah, it's problematic. It's definitely problematic. Mm. Okay. That's Speaking great. of problematic, <laughs> Sonic the Hedgehog. Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> As, oh, I mean, that's more, than more that. disappointing. That's just a problem. That's the the a problem. less said about this, probably the better. So oh. yeah, like we watched the trailer, and um, obviously the trailer was changed because he originally looked like some weird human creature thing. thing. It was really strange. He had tiny eyes. It was we, bizarre. We all know that this was a hoax. Like this was totally a marketing thing because Uncanny yeah. Valley is something that most animators would know about so yeah. they wouldn't suddenly just choose to create a humanoid sonic it's yeah, a move on purpose i think it was an sure. easy way to move this they probably need to do more work on it in regards also like of moving the scheduling so it was supposed to come out in november that's a good idea and if you well. went oh yeah this and oh well we have to do it because of this whoops we just made him look extra real <laughs> <laughs> we did a boo boo it's a weird film. I don't know who it appeals to. Um, if kids are still playing Sonic, I don't. I don't see that. But like, was there actually a story to Sonic ever? I don't remember that. I, I remember either. running and collecting. But there's little Robotnik. To be fair, to run to him. the rings. More, the rings. more. <laughs> and like getting. They even made the little ring sounds. The rings sound. would all fall everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And it was a pain oh. in the ass. To be you fair, you could still get them if you were quick enough. Yeah. <laughs> we're all of the same age, so we grew up with the Sega yeah. and everything like that. Sega. But kids these days have been exposed to. It's like Sonic the Hedgehog, the animated TV series. Is that still so is that, is that exist? Yes, but it's like, it's all, like, most of the animated oh, TV shows. Well, it's really all updated. We're too old and, for it, yeah, that's the truth. Yeah, the one that doesn't really? look like how I remember. So this is kind of... Without the audience for it. No, so this Sonic the Hedgehog is kind of almost doing what Disney's doing with some of their classics. It's becoming a live action. Well, it's the first time yeah, Sega yeah, have it. actually... I agree, actually. Because Sega have just opened, like, um, a film Sega. industry side of it. Do that so they're going to start doing this with a lot more of the films if this is successful. They want to get into that side of the business. But is this not a like nostalgia film? Because I mean, it's Sonic and it's Jim Carrey. Like you can't get yeah. much very, of a yeah, nineties fucking yeah. thing yeah, yeah, yeah. together. From watching That's the trailer, like one of the downsides for me is it, the story looks really incoherent. And I touch on your point: is that was there ever a story within Sonic other than collecting rings, etc.? I mean, I don't know. Right? No, I know. But rhetorical question. Yeah. But the whole premise of it is that he comes to Earth and he gets discovered because he blows out a load of electricity across America and I don't even know if it was the world. It just and is then, not an interesting story. No, but then because he Kids gets discovered, no, but because he gets discovered, <laughs> Jim Carrey's character <laughs> wants to then take away his power, but yet he's got like loads of different technologically advanced. Yeah. equipment to do that it just doesn't it's in my head it's like what throwing a bunch of ideas that have been in other kids films and going put sonic i like it, your no idea sam like this is an educational film <laughs> we all need to know where electricity comes from <laughs> <laughs> it all turns out that's it's why it's sonic. Sonic. storytelling who yeah? knew obviously uh, like sonic, sonic on a treadmill <laughs> <laughs> Kids are be watching it in schools across the world. <laughs> <laughs> the um, the last film is The Invisible Man, which is Bloomhouse's yes. attempt to correct what Universal did so badly with uh, the Mummy. If you remember Tom Cruise's The Mummy, oh god, they... like uh, this is another. That's another example of the universe thing. DC need to give up on the universe. They thankfully gave up on the universe. Yeah. But... The Mummy was such a failure and they expected everyone to go, yeah, sure, we're going to watch 20 films after this because we saw Russell Crowe playing this character and blah, blah, blah. So now they've gone back to the basics. <laughs> it's a horror movie. As these films should have been from the start, yeah. they started as horror films in the 40s and 30s. Why they went, right, we need to get everybody to like them so let's make them into action films when horror makes the most money and costs yeah. them less. That was really dumb. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, they've got, um, I can never remember the director's name, but he did Upgrades, which was a really cool film a couple of years ago. Oh, I remember film. that, yeah. The one yeah, that yeah. came out at the same time as Venom and was kind of like Venom. Yeah, but, but much not. better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He also wrote like the Insidious films and um, oh, nice. Saw. So like he's, he's been working with James Wan, that kind of crowds. And it just seems like an interesting take on The Invisible Man by putting it more on 
the woman that he was with and mm. her survival during him being a bit of a psychopath. Because the character of the Invisible Man has always been a bit of a dick. He's always been a bit of a dick. Even in the most uh, recent version of it, Hollow Man. Remember with Kevin Bacon? Mm. He's, a, he's just a pervert and psycho and egotistical and turns into a villain towards the end. In the original story, he's still a very much not likeable guy because he has this almost godlike skill to be in a, to be everywhere and to you know well, be invisible essentially i think from the trailer the what the premise that they look to set up is that she's in an abusive relationship yes yeah, yeah. and she tries to sneak away and get away from him and he tracks oh, her down and she gets nightmare. into the car and then like smashes the window through but she must get away at some point um and then he apparently kills himself and then finds this way to come back as the Invisible Man. So she gets money given to her, signed over by him um, in his will. And she's very, very conscious of the fact that he wouldn't have done that to himself. Um, which then raises question marks in her mind as to what actually really happened. And I suppose the whole journey of the film then is going to be her going through that trauma, going through that emotion while he's haunting her in their house. See, this sounds like a, a lot better way of doing what uh, Birds of Prey mm. tried, was trying to do, which yeah. is not necessarily man-hating, but explaining the, the vulnerabilities yeah. of the, between yeah, genders yeah. In, that, yeah. in that way. And like, I, I, it looks like a really terrifying film. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, it, it looks... I, I, there's plenty of horror films, obviously, that come from a female perspective, but that seemed to... like Just from watching the trailer, I got the sense that that was just a little bit more... Mm. Uh, looking at that aspect of it than, than some of the other things. I mean, slashers have always looked, sort of thought of that that stalking element and that... that uh, but the vulnerability. Yeah, sexual vulnerability yeah. particularly. You've also got to consider the fact that the the bad person is is literally invisible. So like mm. her, I'm really keen to see what her acting is going to be like. Yeah. Because essentially, yeah, again, focuses entirely this on her. is going to be one hell of a role. Mm. That's the thing, Elizabeth Moss... Um, is a really good actress. She's really like, she's played a lot of very much powerful female characters. So to put her in more of a vulnerable character, at least people can recognize what they seem strong in her in that way. Because mm. even the guy who plays the Invisible Man, I don't know the actor's name. I know he was in um, Haunting on Hill House, but the film's called The Invisible Man. And instead of optioning, because the original one that Universal were gonna do was Johnny Depp was gonna play The Invisible Man. Of course. It's just so, <laughs> but imagine p paying someone to to not be there. Yeah, it seems. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it just yeah. seems crazy. How can I get that job? That name. You can put anyone's <laughs> name on the credits. So you can have my name. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's more interesting. At least with this one, they've gone for more of a name to play the vic uh, the 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 uh, survivor, mm. and I think that's an interesting mm. kind of thing because. She she hasn't done a lot of horror films, but even like her brief cameo in Us, she she she's good. And she's uh, crazy in that. Oh yeah, with the um the other side of her. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think with uh you know obviously what we saw in the trailer as well. There's clearly a moment where she must fight back and take her take yeah. her power back. And I'm interested to see how that's going to play out. Whether it's going to feel like a, a kind of a Halloween-y type, like, slasher type thing. Well, Bloomhouse, isn't it? So that they're yeah. going to want to look into... Because they are more progressive, generally. Yeah, yeah. Whether that's good or bad, it depends on the audience. But yeah. yeah. I really do think, though, that this is going to, you know, sad to say it, but it's going to appeal to a lot of people. No, but that's good. That's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Why is that sad? <laughs> well, because if you think about what I'm trying to say, is that it's gonna people are going to relate to this character. Oh, oh yeah. 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 yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. The only thing that um, it's going to be from like a box office perspective, horrors, horrors always have very good years, as we know, like uh, money wise and critically acclaimed. It's been saving the box office for the last few years, but this year there has been a horror film released every week in uh, America that's basically bombed, and this will be the eighth horror film that's been widely released in America in two months. But I still think that these trends, no, come on, these trends, the trends are nonsense. It's all about uh, what people are excited to see, whether it hits the zeitgeist, whether, I it, so. whether it, it, it looks good, whether it, people are talking about it. I think that, that has way more weight nowadays than, than um, just seeing the named actor in the film. Yeah, I like, agree. Oh, I want to go and see that. 
Like, because people are a lot more um, cynical about what they're going to see. Because mm. uh, if, you know, if they don't want to go and pay for it, they can download it illegally and not bother. Although, so, I sometimes feel like a certain directors, like Tarantino, for example, he does still have that mindset of keeping within the same... And, like, Tim Burton as well. Mm. They have, like, mm. normally sort of the tight crowd of actors that they will always use. Yeah, there's, there's still some But that's more because of their auteurship. I'm not saying it's not auteur. I, I'm saying... You know, gone are the days that you can have a lead actor open a film in the same way as you used to with. Yeah. With big some. Stars. I mean, there's yeah. still some. There are still some people. They, oh yeah. Denzel Washington. He yeah, of course. Always yeah. Bad, you know? <laughs> there's always. There's <laughs> always going to be. Everyone's like, God, yeah. But it's it's far less of a thing now. You know, <laughs> that's why I think that that you know these ideas of like oh well, well horrors horrors going down so you know well, this people is the funny this thing isn't horror. it like. The Invisible Man is sort of selling itself on being the icon that is the Invisible Man. Yeah. So it's still playing on what, you know, it's like, has fandom to relate it yeah, to it's it familiar. already. It's just, what it'll be come down to is if the reviews are good. If the reviews are good, then the film will get, will be, will elevate. If it's bad reviews, then it's just another horror film that people are going to forget. Yeah. Because we see remakes constantly as well, so people get... The, fatigue from it mm. but if the reviews are good and it does have a real decent direction where it goes it'll do well but we could do is, a review on it this clearly isn't a remake this is a, this is a reimagining and that's why well, I people think get people, bored of reimagining yeah, but reboot, I think, remake I, I, it's all the same words to them I think that this is old enough for people to be you know not bothered by that well I, we'll I, see it comes yeah. out at the end of this month I hope it does well <laughs> you sound like you've fallen really out I really want it to do well <laughs> well we'll see won't we <laughs> <laughs> Well, on that note, <laughs> um, guys, yeah, just want to take the moment to uh, thank you for listening again. And thank you for the support on our first two Trash Arts takes. Um, we really, really, really appreciate the, the fact that you're taking the time to listen to us ramble on about films. And uh, if you do like us rambling on or you've got a suggestion, first of all, give us a like, give us a share. And uh, also give us a comment on anything that you would like us to review. Other than that. Just want to say thank you and trash art take out. Uh, and subscribe. Subscribe. Oh, yeah. Subscribe. <laughs> subscribe. <laughs>